Okay. Um, so be in the fellowship hall if you'd like to go. And we welcome all of you. I want to get to the word this morning. And uh, I've been speaking with you concerning last Sunday's message was stay awake. To stay awake. And we were in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And it happens to uh, tell us what has happened. What's going on with the one that you know. That is not repented of their sins. What's really going on with that one that is not a born-again believer, that is not living their life for Jesus, they've not called on him to be their Savior? 2 Timothy 2.26 tells us exactly what's taking place. Now, before your life now as a born-again Christian, you can relate to this. This is what is taking place with the one that does not know Christ as their Savior. 2 Timothy 2.26 says that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now, church, we all know that that is the goal of Satan. It is to take as many as he can captive. He wants to take you captive, the snare, the craftiness of the enemy, to do his will. And as I said last week, one of the main ways that he does this is by deception. He's a deceiver. And uh, verse 26 says that they may come to their senses, escape the snare of the devil. He sets a trap, that trap through deception. One translation said it like this, that they may come to their senses, wake up and get away. That's what we pray. That's the reason for the church. Uh, We're wanting them to wake up, to get away from that snare and that deception of the enemy. So it's important that we stay awake, every one of us. Stay awake from this deception of the enemy. I just don't believe that anyone sets out in their right thinking uh, to just become trapped or become ensnared by the enemy. You don't just get them and say, I want to be. Uh, trapped by the enemy to do his will. I don't think so. We find out, and it's after the fact, because it's deception. If you knew you were getting deceived, you wouldn't have got deceived. But after the fact, we find out that we got trapped. We didn't set out for it, but we got trapped by the enemy, and we fell in that through deception. That word deceived, just to recap, and then moving on. But deceived means this, led astray. It means to stagger, to wander off course. When you're deceived, it means you've been led in a wrong direction. The same word is translated delusion. Ensnared in deception and controlled by a strong delusion. Delusion means that act of tricking you. Delusion is deceiving someone to the place where something is falsely believed and then it gets passed along and passed along and circulated. You you fall for that delusion. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says this. He tells us one of those ways in which he will attempt to deceive us. Giving heed to deceiving spirits. That's what we were on last week. Deceiving spirits. He says having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. I want to remind you again, just in case you weren't here last Sunday. Satan's not just hoping. He's not just hoping that he can maybe catch you in a vulnerable moment and possibly, uh, by chance, deceive you. No, he's very deliberate. He's very intentional. He's very calculated. And he's calculating a plan this very moment. His schemes and his strategies. Right now, he's in an all-out effort to take advantage of everyone that he can Believer and unbeliever. And 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant. That means unlearned or in the dark of his devices, his schemes. So church, uh, <clears throat> as I said to you last week, we don't believe that a born-again believer can be demon-possessed. When we say led astray by a deceiving spirit, I'm not talking about possession. There's no way the Lord Jesus can live in your heart and demon or evil spirit live in your heart at the same time. 
They're not, going, they're not going to exist together. Light and darkness don't have anything in common. You can't be possessed full of Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit of God, and full of or demon-possessed. But what I am saying and what is true, and we saw it in the Word of God, while we're not possessed, you can be influenced. You can be influenced by a deceiving spirit to the place where you're led astray. And we saw all that through the Word of God. Let me just remind you of this. Talking about being influenced, even as a believer, I need to be awake to those deceiving spirits. You remember in 1 Chronicles 21.1, it says this, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David, moved him to number Israel. God didn't tell him to move Israel. Satan stood up and he moved him. He influenced David to number Israel. Verse 7 says, and God was displeased with this thing. He didn't have anything to do with it. Didn't want it. Weren't his will. Therefore, it says he struck Israel. Verse 8, then David, after the fact, realizes I've been hoodwinked. I've been deceived. I've been led astray. And he says in verse 8, so David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing, but now I pray take it away, the iniquity of your servant, for I have done what? Foolishly. He was influenced. You remember in the New Testament. This was David. David, man of great prayer, man after God's own heart, but we see he's influenced, not possessed, influenced, by Satan, to sin and even do a foolish thing. You remember with Peter. Peter, Jesus tells the plan. I'm going to be uh, 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 beaten. I'm going to be hanging on a cross. I'm going to die. And, and you remember what Peter says. Peter, he tries to stop him. Peter gets in the way. You remember he's trying to convince Jesus, no, Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. Don't suffer and die. Uh, he's trying to tell him, don't do any of this you're saying you're going to do. And you remember what Jesus did in Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and he said to Peter, get behind me who? Satan. He said, you're an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of God but of the things of men. Here's Peter, Jesus' very own hand-picked disciple. But we see even Peter, he's being influenced here, influenced by Satan to say wrong things, to do wrong things, and make wrong decisions. And the complete biblical library says it like this of this account. Peter's rebuke was turned against him because he had allowed Satan to motivate his thinking. I just parked the car a minute to say to you, church, we need to be mindful we're vulnerable. I don't get up every morning like some do with germs, and say, I'm not going to touch anything. I'm not doing that. There's germs, germs, germs. Germs are everywhere, and I'm not going anywhere. I don't get up every day and say, there's evil spirits, and evil spirit, and evil spirit, and I got to be careful. No, no, no. He's not wanting us to walk like that, but you got to be awake. You got to be mindful. The enemy's trying to take advantage of all that he can and whoever he can to deceive and influence and lead you astray. Are you with me this morning? Deceiving spirits. We can't, we can't be deceived. You can be. You don't want to be. So praise God. Be on guard and be ready. We are vulnerable. You say, Pastor, that sounds like defeat. No, it's truth. It's the word. We see it here. So be careful. We ask the question, well, how do you not be led astray by those deceiving spirits? As I said last week, don't pay attention. Don't pay attention. You pay attention to being awake, but you don't pay attention when that spirit, that temptation, that scheme, that subtleness of the enemy comes speaking in your mind and in your thoughts. Don't give it attention. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, the spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to. That means paying attention to deceiving spirits, giving heed to, you pay attention to. Then it progresses to following. Then it progresses to being devoted to. Then it progresses to being concerned about. Then it progresses to being to the place where you've attached to it and it's attached to you. Don't, don't give heed to it. Don't pay attention to that seducing, misleading spirit. I say this to say to you, he can only take advantage of you if you give him that place. He can't just walk in. Don't open the door. 
Don't give him the place, the tactics and schemes of the enemy. My thoughts in this direction, my focus is in this direction, and I really, I didn't finish last week, but I was praying to move on. And we went to the men's uh, connect group. And uh, in the connect group, Mark, uh, in the connect groups, if you go there, they, they do spend some time bringing out points in the message. And then you move into the connection. So in them, Mark was doing that, Mark Mitchum. And then he said, you know, he said, I had to take a drive out of town on uh, Monday. And he said, you know, I cut on uh, the radio. He said, the very thing on, he says, was the very thing you preached Sunday. And he said it was a Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie. Anybody have you heard of him? Great preacher. I can tell you, I don't. I, he don't know me. I don't know him. And I didn't call him. I didn't get the sermon. He wouldn't give me time of day. I shouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, we didn't connect. But Mark said he preached your message. You preached him. Well, that's just. It just made me mindful. Preacher like him, with the audience that he had, and what word he's trying to get out there. He said it was right in line, deception, deception, deception. Church is important, especially in the day we're in. So I'm not moving on. I am moving on in the message, but I'm staying with this deception, and it, it made me just back up to another area. A number of years ago, I'd read a book that was given to me, and uh, I went back to that book. Some of this I'm sharing with you came out of it, and then, and then it's what I felt the Lord give me. The book was entitled The Bondage Breaker. It was written by a man named Neil Anderson. And in it, he suggests that there's three primary areas where Satan will use to get you off course, to, to deceive you. One of those ways, he says, and we've covered that, false prophets, false teachers. He'll use false teachers to deceive you. The Bible says that in Matthew 24, 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Get that, deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Lawlessness abound. False teachers, they deceive. That's one way the enemy uses to, to get you off course. But then the other way, as we looked at last week, he suggested deceiving spirits. We covered that. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit expressly says in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits, deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons. But also in that book, and I, I went back to look, and he suggests another area when it comes to deception. And as I looked at that, I saw where it's mentioned all through the Word of God. All through the Word. You see, church, that other area, he says, is this, through deceiving ourself. Deceiving ourself. Church, it's one thing to be deceived by someone else telling you a lie, a false teacher, false preacher. That's one way, and that's one thing, false teachers. It's another way when you have been controlled and being led away by strong delusion through a deceiving spirit, that's another way. But how often do you and I consider the possibility of being led astray to be taken off course because we deceive ourselves? You ever heard anybody say to you, you're deceiving yourself if you think that. You're deceiving yourself if you think that's so. How often do we think that we can deceive ourselves in this way. See, we understand, church, and when I say deceiving myself, I understand who's the instigator. It's still Satan. He's the one provoking. He's the one prodding. He's the one scheming. It's his tactics that he's using to deceive. But in it, again, the word continually says deceiving yourself. Deceiving ourselves. And Satan is behind it. I understand that. But again, I want to walk through this morning. I may not get all these. There's so many. When I got looking, there's more than, than what I even thought. 
And some of you have heard this before, maybe from me, but I, I just couldn't, I just felt like to just go over again, go over this again if you heard it before. And if you haven't, be mindful. You might need to write these down. You might need to write these down. Okay? False teachers, deceiving spirits. But how about when you and I deceive ourselves? Deceive yourself to where you're wandering off course and led astray. How do you deceive yourself, number one? You deceive yourself when you hear the word, but you don't do it. When you hear the word, but then you don't apply it, the Bible says, not Kenny, the Bible says you're deceiving yourself. James 1.22, notice this. But be doers of the word, and what? Not hearers only. And then look at these words. Deceiving yourself. Deceiving yourself. One translation says it like this. Anyone who listens to the word without acting upon it, you're only fooling yourself. I read this in a leadership magazine, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He said, no man can for any considerable time wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which one is the true one. That's true. You can't wear two faces. Any considerable amount of time, one face one place and one face another, one face in the church and one face at another, wearing two faces, hearing the word but not doing it, you can't do it for any amount of time without it coming and seeing what's behind it. Now, church, this is twofold here. Deceive yourself when you hear the word and it says don't do it. That's what the word says. It's twofold. Anytime you and I, you and I are declaring the word, that's not just for me behind the pulpit. Every one of us are to be his witness. We're to be out there declaring the word, living it and declaring it. Speaking the word, the name of Jesus, over our homes, over our families, declaring the word. But anytime you're proclaiming the word to your family, to your friends, to your work, to your church, then I must be sure that I apply it to my own life first. First. If I'm going to declare it, and you should be, then I must be applying it to my own life first. We've all heard the old saying, practice what you preach. Anybody ever thrown that back to you when you gave them the word? Well, you need to practice what you preach. Well, that's the word. <laughs> They're just giving you the word. They're giving me the word. I do need to practice what I preach. Church, listen, if I stand here this morning and every Sunday behind the pulpit and I speak to you, proclaim to you, declare to you, you need to share Jesus with others, but I don't do it, if I preach to you behind the pulpit every Sunday, you need to tithe. You'll be blessed if you tithe. But I don't do it. If I preach to you that you need to walk upright in all your dealings, do your best to walk upright before the Lord, but then I don't do it. Church, he's telling us here, if the word is true and it is, it's got to be true in my own life. It's got to be true in your own life. And that's what he says in that verse. And he says, if it's not, he says, you deceive yourself. Deceiving yourself. But then it's twofold. There's another side to the coin. To the one declaring it, you must also apply it. But on the other side of the coin is the one that's receiving the word. Now, what, now this morning I'm doing all the declaring and you're receiving the word. If you hear it, but you don't put it to practice in your own life, you walk out of here and you don't apply what you hear, you're deceiving yourself. Uh, Francis Beacon said this, It's not what men eat, but what they digest that makes them strong. Not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what, what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. Not what we preach or pray, but what we practice and believe that makes us Christians. They're watching us. And if you hear it this morning and then you don't apply it, he says you're only fooling yourself, deceiving yourself. He says you're just a hearer only. 
I looked up what hearer only means. It was used to describe people who audited a class. In other words, they, they joined the class, they walked into class rather than taking the class for a credit. I don't want a credit. I don't care about that. I don't care about the paper, the credit, the degree. I'm just walking in to the class. In other words, uh, I've come in to hear the lecture. I've come in to gain some knowledge. I've even come to give some input, if you'll let me give some input. But I really don't want any credit here. That's a hearer only. In other words, you're sitting in, but you have no, no, re no, no plans whatsoever to take what you've heard and apply it to your life. He says, that's a hearer only. And James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's what? Sin. Sin. So church, to keep, you say, Pastor, how do I keep from deceiving myself in this area of the applying the word to my life? I want to say this to you. When you read the word, let the word read you. Let it read you. It's a mirror. It's speaking to me. And it's telling me. And what it tells you to do, you know the Nike saying, just do it. When it tells you to do it, just do it. Uh, and then you're not that here only. Listen what he says in James 1.21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with weak meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes in a way, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in all that he does. We want the blessings, right? He says, be a doer of my word, and it comes with a blessing. Praise God. Amen. You deceive yourselves, number one, when you hear and do not do. You with me? You with me? Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, praise the Lord. Number two, just want to make sure you're there. Number two, you deceive yourselves when we say we have no sin. We're deceiving ourselves if we say we have no sin. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Notice the words again. We deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. Read a quote says, Many Christians define sin as the sum total of acts which they themselves do not commit. <laughs> Easy to do, isn't it? Sum total of acts that I don't commit them. Church, I think we've all figured out by now Every one of us in here from pulpit to the pew, it is possible at times for you and I to miss the mark. Every one of us. We understand that. Miss the mark and is sin. To fall in sin. The problem comes in when I deny or I try to cover it up saying I have no sin. There's the problem. Church, I want to say to you and cast brought it out this morning. The Lord already knows we have a sin problem. He knows you have a sin problem. You see, he left the splendor of heaven. He came to this earth. And his name when he came was Jesus. And his name today is still Jesus. And that very name means what? Savior. He came as Savior, and he's still Savior. Say, Pastor, what he's saying? His name is Jesus, which is Savior. And he came to this earth to do what? Save his people from their what? Sins. He knows already we have a sin problem. Sin doesn't catch him by surprise. When you and I fall into sin, don't catch him by surprise. It don't frighten him one bit when you fall into sin or I fall into sin. No, church, he came to this earth not to get away from sin, not to, not to get away. He came to this earth for what reason? For sinners, to save sinners from their sin. So listen, church, saying to you this morning, when you deny the fact that it's sin, when we deny the fact that we don't have sin, the very reason he came was to save you from sin. And it's not caught him off guard when you do it. Don't have a license to do it, but it's what he came for. 
Mark 2 and 17 says this, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Most people would be a little embarrassed to have an unexpected company when their house was a mess. My family was staying in a hotel in Nigeria, West Africa. One time when I heard a knock at the door and I opened it and I found a smiling Nigerian gentleman ready to clean our room. I was so embarrassed. My family had travel bags, curling irons, crumpled clothing, sprawled all over the unmade beds. Wet towels were all over the bathroom floor. I apologized profusely, but the young man replied graciously, No problem, sir. For this reason, I've come to put your things in order. The Bible says that's exactly what Jesus has come to do, to put your life in order. He doesn't demand that you first straighten up your mess. He says, I've come to help you straighten up your mess. But church, in order for that to happen, you cannot say you do not have no sin. If you continually deny it, if you continually try to cover it up, it's never going to happen, and you stay in your mess. So he's telling us here, you say, Pastor, how, how, do I, how do I not be deceived in this way? When you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. Do not expect God to cover up what you're not willing to uncover. I'm saying to you this morning, don't deny it. Saying to you this morning, don't say or don't believe that it's not a part of our human nature or your life. The Word tells you to do what with it? Confess it. Confess every Sunday these altars are open, and I encourage you to come to confess it. Get rid of it. Don't run from God. Run to God. Run to Him and confess the sin. Repent of it. Get up and move on. Praise God. But don't say you don't have it if you're denying it. You're only deceiving yourself. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Just want to make sure you're here. Don't want you deceived. Don't push it away. God knows we have the problem. It's not a license to do it. But understand, he understands the struggle. And we keep running to him and keep running to him. Number three, we deceive ourselves when we think we're something, when we're really not. Galatians 6, 3 says, If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, Here's the words again. The false teacher deceived me. No, he deceives himself. You deceive yourself. You say, Pastor, you're always telling us just the opposite, that we are something. You're always telling us we are to walk in our identity. You're always telling us we are always to declare we're a child of God. We are something. You're telling us we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, and we should declare that. You're always telling us we should declare we're more than conquerors. Always telling us to declare we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. Church, I believe that. You are something. You are someone in your identity in Christ, and you need to boldly declare it, believe it, and live it. But here's where the deception comes in. The deception comes in when you and I believe or imagine that in and of ourself, in and of ourself, we're something. And what it does is opens the door to pride. The minute you open the door to pride, he says, thinking you're something when you're not, you're deceiving yourself. I don't think I have to remind you how prevalent this is, widely accepted and practiced in our world today. Look at it, thinking we're someone ourself in our world today. It's in the work world, promoting self. It's in the sports world. We're something. We're someone in ourselves. It's in the political world, right? We're something. We're someone. And all we're hearing, sadly, it's in the church world. God's blessed and God's blessed and God's blessed. And the next thing you know, the one is thinking, I'm the one. And it's something because of me. And it's all in the church world. Church, the truth is every talent, every ability that we have and the life that we are living, your personal accomplishments, everything, we don't take the credit for. It was God that blessed and God that gave. Everything we have is because of him. Romans 12, 3 
You say, Pastor, how do I keep from being deceived in this way of getting to the place where I, I have a wrong view of myself, a measure of yourself? There's two words, and I want you to just see this scripture. It'll keep you in the middle of the channel. It's not good to get out of the channel. If you stay in the middle of the channel here, and there's one verse keeps you, so that you don't have the overinflated opinion of yourself. And it's this of Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt with each one a measure of faith. Church, to keep you in the channel with this measure of yourself, remember two words, grace and faith. Whatever we have comes through whom and what? The grace of God. The grace of God. And also faith, whatever faith we have to accomplish the impossible, to do what we do, the Bible says God gave you the measure of faith. It'll keep you there. God, no matter, no matter how much he blesses you and with what he blesses you with, God, it's by your grace and it's through faith that you gave me the measure to believe. Amen. And it'll keep you in the place you need to be in that place, deceiving yourself. Number four. We deceive ourselves. Number one, when you hear the word and don't do. Number two, when you say you have no sin. Number three, when you think you are what you're not. And number four, we deceive ourselves when we think we're wise in this age. I want to give you two scriptures about this wise in this age, and I touched on it last week, the wisdom and often the wisdom of this world, and we fall in that trap. 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Again, let no one deceive himself. Deceiving yourself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And in Romans 1, 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth of unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their own thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22 professing to be wise, they became fools. Notice that. Professing to be wise, really they became fools. Church, you're living in a world today, I don't have to tell you this, there's a lot of people professing to be wise. Wise by what standards? The world's standards. You listen to the beliefs, listen to the philosophies, of this world and this culture that we are in today. And what you think or they think is considered uh, acceptable. I want to tell you, church, it may seem wise. It may seem the right direction to go. And the whole culture's going. But understand, it's not acceptable in God's Word. It's not acceptable in His Word. God considers that kind of wisdom that we're seeing today gender issue. You see that. All the areas of sin. You see what's taking place. He considers all of it foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1 8, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Church, I want to say to you, no one is ever going to come to know Jesus Christ through the wisdom of this world the philosophies of this world. They'll never come to know the truth through that way. When you tell them that story, it's the power of God to change them. But the wisdom of world says this, God's chosen one, 
His anointed one, leave the glory of heaven, come to this earth, be crucified on a cross, and die for you and I that we can be forgiven of our sins. Church, the world says that's foolish thinking, foolish wisdom. He wouldn't be God. He would cease to be God if he died. That's the way the world thinks. Church, I want to tell you the message of the cross. God says it's foolishness to this world. But I want to say to you, it's the power of God unto salvation. And we believe that message of the cross. Jesus did come. Jesus did die. Jesus gave his life. You stick with that wisdom. Stick with that. You'll be glad you did. You won't be deceived. Follow the old rugged cross message. Follow the Christ message. He came to give his life. The world says it's ridiculous. They say it's foolish. But I want to tell you, church, it's not. And it will keep you. Amen. Cling to it. We deceive ourselves when we and become prime candidates led to his craftiness when we jump into the wisdom of this world. Don't jump into it, but stay with the word. Number five. I didn't realize there was this many. Are you with me? Just the ones that say you're deceiving yourself. And let me back to this just a minute about that of the wisdom of the world that says all this is all right when it don't add up with this. I want to tell you sometimes we struggle. Where's my peace? Where's my joy? And where did it go? Be careful that you don't just flow into this culture's wisdom that they're accepting everything. And then you're asking the question, well, what happened with my joy and peace? Why can't I sense the Lord? Why can't I sense his moving? I read this titled Hanging Up Our Faith. I remember looking or take I remember talking to a girl here in this church, not this one, it's someone another article. I remember talking to a girl here in this church two or three years ago. She said, Jill, I've lost my joy. I've lost my peace, and I want it back. Where did you lose it, I asked. That has nothing to do with this, she replied. Help me get it back. But where did you lose it? I don't want to talk about that. But eventually, she did talk about it. She said she lost it when she moved in with her boyfriend. That'll do it. Pastor, close line speaking. No, wisdom of the world says go ahead and try it. If it works, then marry. <laughs> Move in, then marry. Culture, ways of the world, wisdom of the world, philosophies of the world. If it don't add up with the word, it's not right. You deceive yourself, he says, when you think you're wise to this age. Be careful. Be careful. Okay? That's what you're talking about, shacking up. I'm just trying to be clear. They are. It's in my face everywhere. Church, listen. Uh, I, I'm just here sounding the warning. And there's more and more coming. We, we start, that just started in that area, and now look what we've led to. Be careful. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now over this congregation. Your word is truth. Let us be mindful, not deceived, and not deceiving ourselves to the philosophies and culture that is so being dumped on us and our children. We sing, we speak the name of Jesus over our family. Help us walk the truth before them. Father, I pray that deception, deception, deception be revealed. Every person here today, in Jesus' name, amen. Number five, are you with me? We're getting close. 
Number five, we deceive ourselves when we believe. Next week, David Crabtree will be here, and I don't believe he'll be speaking on this, okay? You'll get a break. We deceive ourselves when we believe we're spiritual. Our spiritual life is together when our tongue is out of control. Say, Kenny, I wish you'd stayed on the last one. I got it all together here spiritually. I'm the most mature spiritually. All the while, your tongue's out of control. James 1.26 says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, notice this, he but deceives his own heart. This one's religion, he says, is useless. I read this quote some time ago. It says, speak when you're angry and you'll make the best speech you'll ever regret. It's an un <laughs> I'm laughing at myself. I've done it. You'll regret that. That's the unbridled tongue. Church, I don't believe any one of us in here has a desire to grieve God in any way. I just don't, you're here today, you don't want to grieve God. That's why you're here. But I want to say this, there is nothing, nothing I believe that grieves him any more than we badmouth other people, especially those of the household of faith. Grieves God when that tongue is unbridled and we're badmouthing. I know that's not proper English either, but it's, you, you get it. It's bad mouth. Everything falls with that, criticism, slander, all of it, gossiping. When we're bad mouthing instead of building up, building up, I believe it grieves God. I read this, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, any of you heard of him? Great evangelist. Going, this is, he, he's a strong preacher, and here's what he said. He entitled it Verbal Abuse. The angry word is a blow struck at our brother, a stab at his heart. It seeks to hit, to hurt, and to destroy. A deliberate insult is worse, for we openly disgrace our brother in the eyes of the world, causing others to despise him. Think of that. We openly do that. We're causing others to despise when we're, think, when we're speaking out and tearing down others. So you want to keep from deceiving yourselves. Here's what he says. James says, keep a tight rein on your tongue. And then he gives a beautiful picture of it in James 3, 2, and 3. He says, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. I won't say the name, but someone came in this morning and said, I'm learning to be more quiet and speak less. I looked to them and I said, that's a sign of maturity. I need it. When we learn to say less and listen more, it's a sign of maturity. And he says here, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Just a little bit in that large horse and the bit attached to the reins just a little straps of leather, and you control the whole body. That's what he's saying about that tongue. Complete Biblical Library says the bridled tongue presupposes bridled thinking. In other words, the way you control your words is to first control your thinking by meditating, thinking on the word. I won't say that you say, How? I just can't help it, Pastor. I get on there and I got the gossip. I get in there and I got the back. I got to get on Chris. I got, I just, I can't help it. Listen, a bridled tongue presupposes bridled thinking. Control your words. How? First control your thinking. And how do you control your thinking? Meditate on the word. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification that it might impart grace impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. 
Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God forgave you. That's the word. Move on to the next one, Kenny. Number six. We're almost done. Aren't you glad? Deceive yourself. Control the tongue. Get in the word. Control your thinking first. Number six, we deceive ourselves when we think we're not going to reap what we sow. Say, Pastor, is that the word? <laughs> Listen, it is. And it's really biting me. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that man he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will also of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There are some principles that God set in place. They're there. They're not going to change. It's his law. It's the law that is in place. Sometimes as a believer, I think we feel we're exempt from those laws. You feel like it's not applying to me and I'm not going to reap what I've sown. The church, listen, I totally believe when you go to an altar or wherever and you ask forgiveness, God forgives you right then, clean slate, and it's thrown in a sea of forgetfulness, never more to be remembered, never more to be held against you. All your past is gone. Far as the east is from the west, you're forgiven. But also we do need to understand we, some, we sometimes have to live with those consequences. You sowed them, you reap them. Pastor, why'd you tell me that? It should have all went away. Consequences are still there of the past. And he says, be, be, don't deceive yourself. What you sow, you're going to reap. Sow joy, reap joy. Sow forgiveness, reap forgiveness. Sow peace, reap peace. Sow kindness, reap kindness. Sow it because you reap it. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Sow it and reap it. We win or lose by the seeds we choose. Sow that seed and reap it. Number seven, we deceive ourselves when we think the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God. Deceiving yourself when you think the unrighteous, in other words, the unsaved. In other words, those that are not born again. In other words, those that have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The unrighteous, we're deceiving ourselves. You're living in a world today, it's all inclusive. Many ways to heaven. Everybody's going, no matter what you believe. Deceiving yourself. You say, Pastor, is that the word? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Notice the next words. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covenants, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. He said it. I can't change it. He said it. You can't change it. He said it. Unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says we're just deceiving ourselves if we think different. You're living in a world, anything goes. In the church world, sadly, anything goes. In God's way, it's not that way. So we're deceived if we believe any lifestyle doesn't line up with the Word of God is okay. Are you with me? Say amen, Pastor. Say it's the Word, Pastor. Okay. What did Brother Chase used to say? Say, oh me or, or amen. <laughs> oh me or amen. <laughs> Something like that, he said. Okay. Number eight, this is the last one. I know you're ready. 
I don't want to see you deceived. I don't want to be deceived. Don't want to deceive myself. No false teacher, no deception of a deceiving spirit, and I certainly don't want to deceive myself. Number eight, we deceive ourselves when we continually associate with bad company and think we're not going to be corrupted. When you, I shared this with you before, one in the Bible study used to always say, you hang around the barbershop long enough, you're going to get a haircut. <laughs> you hang around with bad company long enough, it's going to wear off on you. Say, no, pastor, I'm supposed, Jesus ate with sinners. I'm supposed to go minister to them. You are. You are church. That's the church. This is a hospital for sick folks. He came to save sinners. Don't get it all messed up and confused here. But 1 Corinthians 15, 33, notice what it says. First words, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. You should minister to others. You should pour into the lives of others. But you cannot immerse yourself in their environment and think that that's not going to rub off on you. I had one gentleman I made this clear to after they had come out of a certain type of facility because their mess got them in it. And immediately when they came back to see me after getting out, I said, be careful now who you're hanging with, where are you going, you can't. And the words that person looked to me and I still see their face and I can't see their face anymore. They said to me, I'm too strong for that. Church, I'm just telling you being deceived if you think you continually hang with the old cronies and it not wear off on you. Pour into them. But he says here, don't be deceived. Bad company will corrupt good morals. Choose wisely your friends. Choose wisely the environment you're hanging around. Well, that's where it says you might find some more. False teachers. Deceiving spirits. Deceiving ourselves. You're in a world today, church, so again, you hear the word, but you don't do it, deceiving yourself. Say you have no sin, deceiving yourself. Run to God with the sin. Confess the sin. Don't deny it. Don't try to cover it up. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He's not afraid of your sin. He came because of sin. We think we're something when we're not. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Praise the Lord. We're nothing without His armor and His might. Stay with it. We think we are wise in this age, operating in worldly wisdom. God says it's foolishness wisdom. We think we are religious, but we don't bridle our tongues. We think that we will not reap what we sow, negative or positive. We think the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible says no. We think we can continually associate with bad company and it's not going to corrupt us if we're not careful. All of those, church, we need to be, you say, Pastor, what's the answer? What's the answer? As I've shared with you many times, two things. One, discerning of spirits. Pray for discernment of spirits. It is there for you to be able to discern from right from wrong. And today it's getting so messed up to whether the world don't know what's right and what's wrong. They're calling everything right and nothing wrong. It's so cloudy. It's so, the water's so mudded to discernment. But you pray for discerning. Discernment of spirits. It's a gift. It's one of the nine. But pray for discernment. It implies supernatural power of spiritual insight to detect and expose satanic strategies and demonic attribute, attributes. I often pray over you, and I pray God let them see what they can't see in the natural. I'm praying for you for discernment, that you can see what you can't see in the natural eye, but you see in the spirit. It's discernment to be able to detect 
what's going on. Listen to this. I'm really closing. In his book, The Gospel According to Starbucks, some wouldn't want me to even say Starbucks, but he tells the story of a man named Ed Ubert, Fobert. He's one, his nickname is Cupper. Cupper. In layman's terms, he's a coffee taster. I want you to get this. And his taste buds are actually certified by the state of New York. That's strong taste buds, isn't it? So refined are Mr. Fobert's sense of taste for coffee that even while blindfolded, he can take one sip of coffee and tell you not just that that coffee's from Guatemala, but he can also tell you what state it comes from, what altitude it was grown at, and what mountain it was grown on. That's sensitive taste bud. You say, Pastor, what's that got to do with me? He, he, he knows what is real, and he can detect what is real. I'm saying to you about discernment. Have those kind of taste buds, the Word of God. Know what it says and be able to discern to where you can discern the Spirit. And it's not right. This thing don't add up. Discernment. And then lastly, pray for discernment of spirits. You say, how do I not be deceived, Pastor? Stay with this. Discerning of spirit. God, give me discernment. And God, keep me in this. Stand with me. I told you I was going to stop. An airplane pilot is not to trust his own instincts in a storm, but he's to trust the instrument panel. Instincts can be wrong if he experiences vertigo. Anybody ever had vertigo? Man, you're all over the place, right? Well, what if the pilot experiences vertigo and he's trying to trust his own instincts?